Batuan. Uh, thanks for joining the Startup Club Health Tech Investment Conference. I'm Batuan, and I'll be the host today. Uh, before we start, I'd like to say a few words about the Startup Club. So we are a global entrepreneur community. We connect companies with investors through these events and support their fundraising since 2019. We organize more than 100 events uh, for different industries, health tech, fintech, B2Tech, green tech, and there will be more industries soon. Um, today, we invited eight health tech startups. Let me share my screen so you can take a look at them as I'm speaking. And um, each company will do five minute presentation that will be followed by seven minutes Q&A and feedback session with the advisory board members. We have a very strong lineup with you know, different focus, different industries, um, different areas, sorry from cancer diagnostic to treatment, from Alzheimer's treatment to nutrition tracking. So I hope everyone will enjoy listening to this speech. And we have five advisory board members joining with us today. Actually, um, there will be four. Um, SD, unfortunately, from Echo Ventures is not able to join anymore. She had last minute emergency. But we have four great advisors. So Marcus from Hedium Ventures, Katerina from Carista, White from Hill Capital, and Jill from Health Innovation Capital. I'll ask advisory board members to quickly introduce themselves. Then we can um, go to the pitches. The event will take two hours, less than two hours. So we'll finish before 8 p.m. European time or 2 p.m. Eastern time. And yeah, um, Marcus, could you please introduce yourself? Thanks for joining. Hi, this is Marcus. Nice to meet you all. Um, I work for Hadian Ventures, which is a European life science venture fund. We invest broadly in all areas of life science, so therapeutics, diagnostics, medtech, and digital health. Primarily in Europe, can also do US investments, usually Series A and onwards. We have currently a fund of 145 million euros. Um, my background is in oncology, where I hold a PhD. And I'm working for Hayden already for now five years as a senior investment associate and currently also an MBA uh, student at Imperial College. Amazing. Thanks so much, Marcus. Um, Katerina? Yeah, hi, everybody. So I'm Katerina. I'm managing, managing partner at Clarista. Uh, I'm joining the company a long time ago now and uh, investing in, in uh, healthcare and a VC uh, stage for, uh, for a while. So at Carista, we, we invested in a very early stage company uh, usually, and we, uh, we are just raising a fund with the ability to invest from C to Series B, um, main focus on uh, digital health and health tech companies, uh, med tech companies, sorry. So with a ticket between half a million to 8 million euros. Great. Thanks so much, Katerina. Uh, Wahid, please introduce yourself as well. Hey everybody, this is Bahid from uh, Heal Capital. Um, looking forward to all the pitches. Also ha very happy to be here. Um, my background is in transcription biology. I have a PhD from the Max Planck Institute for Molecular Genetics here in Berlin, Germany. Um, I work on the investment team at Heal Capital. What we do is a strict focus on health tech. Um, it's a one to five million initial ticket size. We're investing out of a hundred million fund. Uh, what I love to specialize in is, I would say, tech bio or any sort of convergence between software, um, machine learning, and ways to impact or improve uh, patient workflows. Uh, that's about it. Looking forward to the event. Great, thank you. Thanks so much, Wahid. Um, Jill. Hi, everyone. Pleasure to meet you. I'm Jill Conowich. Uh, I'm Director of Therapeutics and Innovation at Health Innovation Capital. We are a pediatric and maternal fetal medicine focused fund. We invest across the spectrum in uh, digital health, med tech, diagnostics, and therapeutics. My background is I'm a physician scientist by training. Uh, I was a radiation oncologist and then shifted into uh, consulting and recently moved into the venture world. Amazing. Thank you so much for being here today. All right. Um, the first pitch for this company is Aveta Medical. Brian will present the opportunity. By the way, everyone in the audience, you can use the chat to interact with the presenters, you know, ask a question, make a comment or introduce themselves. So you can use the chat. 
but uh, only advisory board members will lead the discussion after pages. So you can only use chat to interact with the presenters. Brian, I, get, I see you there. Welcome. Hello, everybody. Thank um, you so much. You have you will have five minutes for presentation, okay. and there will be seven minutes. Um, Thank you. You can start a presentation when you are ready. Can you see my presentation? I'll just share a screen, actually. Yes, you should share a screen. Share a screen now. and. Uh... The share screen. <clears throat> share screen. Okay, you can see my. Yes. Okay, great. Okay. Good uh, afternoon and good morning, everybody. My name is Brian Ledwood. I'm the CEO and director of Avita Medical, a Galway based company developing a highly disruptive and technology in to treat GSM, uh, previously known as vaginal atrophy. A chronic progressive condition that affects 80% of women in menopause. With globally advancing in healthcare, women are living longer. Women spend 40% of their lives in post-menopause. By 2025, this number of women in menopause will increase to 1.1 billion globally. So consider this, a condition so prevalent that 50% of postmenopausal, 15% of perimenopausal, and 70% of breast cancer survivors will endure in silence. Vaginal atrophy is a systemic challenge affecting millions, reducing quality of life, and demanding an innovative solution. <clears throat> Vaginal atrophy strains relationships, shatters self-esteem, and stands between women, women's happiness. The sad reality is that 82% of women are reporting life disruption. It is clear that vaginal atrophy affects happiness and well-being. 66% state that it significantly affects their intimacy with their partners, with 25% saying that this, they don't see a future with their partners, an intimate future, uh, due to the pain this condition causes. <clears throat> it's not moving up, sorry. Next screen. Sorry, one second. Yes, yeah, sorry. Um, the current offering are either ineffective, inexpensive, or not approved and may result in harsh side effects. These offerings do not meet the needs of women during the midlife um, and the responsibility that brings. Avita Medical excels in all these areas. So what is vaginal atrophy? The underlying condition is that of reduction of estrogen during the production, uh, uh, during production from the ovaries. Um, this reduces blood flow to the tissue, resulting in reduced elasticity, reduced moisture, and reduced tissue, um, tissue thicknesses. A beta medical solution reverses these changes and provides a much needed safe and effective therapy, a long-term solution with no side effects. Our proprietary solution, um, it's hormone-free, painless, and offers rapid and sustained relief at an affordable cost. This treatment can be administered in just five minutes, once per month, um, and it meets the needs of women uh, currently. So how this treatment is administered, you will see uh, intravaginal tip. Uh, it's a pneumatic um, uh, generated, and that pneumatic air pressure is um, administered at the orifices. Those orifices then induce the tissue into those orifices, causing a therapeutic effect. That therapeutic effect, uh, microtrauma, generates angiogenesis, increases blood flow, increases material thickness or tissue thickness, moisture, and relieves the symptoms of vaginal atrophy. And it's working. Uh, it, it, we had a first in human trial and 10 out of 12 patients reported a minimum of 25% improvement of their, of their um, most bothers and symptoms, three of which had a full, full re re relief of their symptoms and, and four out of 12 had, um, sorry, uh, we also had objective evidence where five out of 12, um, nine out of 12 patients had uh, changes to their tissue cells um, reported from the primary investigator. So in, with this information, this was uh, no pain from a VASC scale. Uh, there were, all patients reported a zero to one on a VASC scale. No uh, anesthesia needed and absolutely no downtime or no aftercare required. So this was very positive from a first in human trial perspective. The team here is a multidisciplinary team. We have been performing and forming very well with all of our milestones. Um, we are uh, bolstered with a, clinic, a commercial team from Eileen Duffy, who has 25 years experience in bringing um, 
uh, indigenous companies to market and get into IPO. Um, we also are supported by our clinical team, Professor James Liu. He was an ex-NAMS North American Menopause Society um, uh, chair, and also Nancy Phillips work, work, working with Rutgers and IMA. So well supported from a from a basic from a from a clinician perspective. The opportunity here is a, a total addressable market of 9.25 uh, million women, 5.5 uh, million women uh, in US alone in a service addressable market, and with a beachhead, which has these patients have no other alternative. Uh, we have a 2 million uh, beachhead number, which has a 7.3 CAGR, so a very uh, impressive um, growth in market here. Our mechanism here is a B2B to B to C. Uh, so we are supplying our product to clinicians. Uh, they then prescribe to their patients and we get a one to 40 ratio here per month. So one clinician uh, can um, convert 40 patients onto our, onto our treatment. Uh, we will be supporting this from uh, direct to customer marketing and that will ramp up our, our uh, conversion rates uh, thereafter. Great, thank Our you, Brian. I, I, thank I, you. I, yeah. I have to stop you there. Uh, That's you okay. Five minutes. We can talk more about the organization. Thank you so much. Uh, thank, you so um, much. thank you, everybody. Great, great presentation. Uh, Marcus, would you like to start? Do you have any comment or question mm -hmm. about it? Yeah, uh, thanks. Uh, very, very nice overview and, and good introduction. I was just Thank wondering, you. in terms of business model, it's then basically the one-time sale of the device, or how the, how how does that yeah, work in the long term? There is there is two two routes to market here. The first route to market is, um, as I say, direct direct. We we sell to the clinician, the the, the wellness centers, um, the menopause clinics. Uh, and they are converting patients. Uh, initially, um, we have, a, in terms of our roadmap, we have initially a de novo clearance, which will allow us to supply this product to, to in-clinic use. Um, thereafter, then we have a 510K, which allows us to uh, uh, broaden the, the benefit of this product to uh, prescription home use. So what we see is initially, we will be selling to clinicians to complete treatments in clinic. And then when they have adopted the patient and, and shown efficacy in the clinic, the patient then can maintain the benefit um, at home by purchasing the unit and, and using the home device. Uh, this is a chronic progressive condition. So this does may require uh, maintenance, um, so top-ups. So when they are in the clinician's office, they will get the initial um, treatment and then they'll maintain that treatment thereafter. Great, thank you. Um, Katerina? Katerina, do we have any questions? Yeah, Please. sorry. Um, so why do, do you do it only once a month? Yeah, so at the moment uh, we are well, our initial uh, assessment of this product was that it would be required once a month. Um, our feasibility study um, was executed in April 2022 and completed in October 2022. We are now doing 10 month and 12 month follow up. And we are seeing that the benefit of this uh, treatment is, is actually beyond one month. So this gives us a much more viable outcome in the clinic because it reduces the amount of times the patient has to come back. Um, and as I say, we can then top up. So what we will look at is that this offering will, will, will be set at a price point, um, cost a patient of $1,000 a year, um, whether it, and that will be aligned with the with the benefit of this of this treatment, but in terms of the lifetime value of this product, uh, we will see that from a ten to fifteen year uh, lifetime value, given the, the chronic progressive condition, and a thousand dollars a year on consumable tips will be utilized. Okay, my question is more: if you are using it more frequently, is it more efficient or? Not. Yes. So, in terms of the anatomical um, reaction to the to the treatment, uh, you need initially four treatments uh, to build up the the tissue uh, response. Uh, thereafter, then you need top ups to maintain that because as soon as you stop the condition, as soon as you stop the treatments, uh, you will get an initial a benefit for a number of months, and then the lack of estrogen will 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 start to erode that benefit. So you will need top ups thereafter. Thank you. Thank you, Katerina. Uh, Jill? Sure, okay. yeah. Uh, definitely have some questions. Um, first thing I kind of wanted to ask is, how are you thinking about this within the space of the competitive land speeds of like laser energy devices that are now be using yep. for vaginal atrophy? Mm-hmm. 
So we have been working with our clinicians and knowing clinicians that have been using laser therapy. So really a USP for us is the capital cost of our equipment. Our technology is a relatively low level technology in terms of the vacuum, which means our capital cost is significantly lower, about 10x lower. So the main impediment and the cost to patient and cost, uh, cost to clinician and, and, and end user is to amortize the capital cost of laser. So the capital cost of laser uh, is generally $120,000 to purchase the equipment. And then you have to amortize that over, over your treatments. So we would see that we're, uh, we have a number of USPs. One is a lower cost of treatment for both uh, the capital cost and the per treatment cost for a clinician. Uh, we also have the home use benefit, which when it's transferred to home use, significantly reduces the economic uh, impact on the end user. Um, so really in the, also in terms of the benefit of our product, uh, we have no uh, aftercare. So in terms of laser, it 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 does burn the tissue. Uh, it's it's that's the mechanism of action, and that burning of the tissue requires aftercare in terms of cooling. Um, so the anesthetic anesthetic um, ointment that's used only per, only delays the pain. So there is aftercare pain on the laser in terms of soothing and bathing that area uh, to main, to reduce the pain. So uh, we we believe. Um, we not only reduce the cost, but we reduce the burden of pain thereafter uh, with the same effects of treatment. Do you feel there are contraindications to this treatment within the population, like uh, collagen vascular disorders, if there's been surgery or radiation to the area? Um, what are you guys thinking yeah. about more specifically within your beachhead? And mm -hmm. with your beachhead, are you addressing you know, the numbers of the 50 percent that you were like quoting on postmenopausal women we believe actually to be higher in the 80 percent range mm -hmm. how are you approaching reaching out to kind of the gap in women that are missed going to the hospital going to the doctor okay Num number of questions there but um so let's let's answer the last one in terms of our, our approach is to be in clinic then home use and then given the simplicity of our product uh we're designing a one program product uh, so that will lend itself to eventually over the counter. Um, and as I said in our marketing, we will not only be marketing to the clinicians, but we'll also market to the to the the users, the end users through SEO, uh, through uh, campaigns, and through uh, influencers. That's in our in our marketing plan. So um, yes, we know that there's a significant amount. You know, there's 60, 60 Three percent of women don't attend the clinic at the moment. Um, we believe that with this offering, that will increase because uh, the, the the current offerings aren't aren't meeting the needs of the users, uh, end users. So with it, with having an option that's non-hormonal and also through marketing and and progressing of of the menopausal uh, market, we believe that number will increase. Um, uh, right. Just in terms of okay, yeah, um, I know there's other questions there too. Sorry, Jill. Uh, there was a number <laughs> of questions there. Uh, can you remind me just of, of one of the other questions you had just to clarify and close off? Uh, if you, I was asking about country indications when we can talk offline about that. Okay, thanks, Jill. Yeah, no problem. We will. Okay, Take, thanks so much, Brian. Great presentation, great answers. Please feel free to reach out, Brian, after the event to learn more about it. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, um, everybody. Appreciate and the it. Next, next company is Aurora Life Science. Philo Boras will present the opportunity. Philo, feel free to share your screen. Hi. Thank you very much. Give me a second. Sure. So you should see my screen, right? Yep. Yes. Okay. So thank you for having me. My name is Philo Boras. Uh, I'm one of the founders and CEO of Aurora Life Science. Um, we are based in Germany and we are automatizing the nutrition tracking process and using AI to build a holistic solution for people that need or want to track their nutrition. Um, why is this important? Um, I have a nice example from one of our customers. Um, she uh, She's a mother of a little girl and uh, her girl has diabetes type 1. And so she needs to track all the foods that she's preparing for her girl. And um, because she needs to calculate the amount of insulin um, that she takes. And that's a, a really painful process. You do it every day for every meal, for every drink, for everything you consume. And it uh, takes a lot of time and effort on top of everything else uh, to do this. And um, so this is uh, a quite big relief for people that are doing this daily. Um, but there are also more. So you have also, if you go for the lifestyle segment it's on the left here, you have 300 million people uh, doing their nutrition, mostly for lifestyle reasons. So gaining weight, losing weight, doing a specific sport that requires a specific nutrition. Um, so dietary needs for that. And on the other half, you have 
uh, almost 600 million um, diabetics worldwide at the moment, uh, and their numbers are growing, and uh, half of them, um, almost half of them, can be treated with nutrition tracking solutions um, by just changing um, their their eating behavior and helping them to um, yeah um, live a, a little bit more healthier lifestyle. Um, this supports uh, nutrition tracking. Um, so what we built is uh, we built a ho holistic system for people that are tracking their nutrition um, based on uh, a daily cooking behavior. So we took a, a cutting board and made it smart enough to do the nutrition tracking for you. Um, like you see on the left, it's a, it's a wooden cutting board placed on a, on a kitchen scale with a um, touchscreen interface and sensors. So you place food on the cutting board and Nutri will tell you uh, immediately what food it is um, and calculate based on the weight, uh, the nutrients, uh, the calories and the micronutrients and vitamins, everything you need. Um, and then synchronizes this to our app. Um, so a completely automatic uh, nutrition diary that is just uh, created while you're cooking. So you don't have to do anything else. You just cook, prepare your food and everything else is already done for you by our AI system. Um, as you can see, uh, 300 million people uh, in the in the um, lifestyle market plus the diabetics alone is a big market, but there are also much more diseases that can benefit from a good and automatized nutrition tracking solution. Um, at the moment, we're focusing on the German, Austria, Switzerland region, um, and we want to expand to Europe and the US in the future. Um, with our next funding round, you will be able to achieve um, kind of 3.8 to 4 million um, annual recurring revenues um, with the product. And um, we do this with three pillars. We have um, yeah, two options for the people. You can buy the device and the app and they have like a, let's call it a lifetime subscription where all the services are included. And we have like uh, around 800 euros a payment for the end customer at that point. They can also be a member of the neutral platform. Then they get the device cheaper for 250 euros and have a monthly subscription. Um, between 15 and 30 euros, depending on the duration of the subscription. So as if you go for a longer contract, you pay less per month. And um, of course the app can be used standalone. We have a freemium model for the app um, to uh, users that want to use the app only. Um, so when you're on the go, you can use the app, for example. Um, as, I, as I mentioned, we are starting with the lifestyle segment because the data is low regulated. Um, we have a strong community there. They are really uh, intrigued and interested in the, in the topic. They do it already. Um, even if they suffer the pain of doing it daily um, with all that uh, extra work. Um, so we're focusing on a D2C approach in the beginning. Um, this will allow us to get enough um, momentum to go for more prevention-based or therapy-based approaches so we can scale the technology to other products in the, in the prevention or in the therapy space. And um, we already proved that the D2C approach works. Um, we started uh, by asking people to pre-order the device and they showed them the device and we've built a social media funnel that worked pretty well. We had really good conversion rates and sold 352 products um, over that campaign uh, with earnings of around 110,000 euros. Um, at the moment, we're in the manufacturing of the first 1,000 devices. 500 will be uh, delivered in June and 500 in August. Um, our supply chain is set, our manufacturing partner is set um, we also teamed up with uh, Rewe, it's a German um, supermarket uh, group. Um, they will supply us with the ability to deliver food. So if you get a nutrition plan from us, you get uh, recipes and all the stuff that help you um, optimize your diet. Um, Rewe uh, will uh, deliver the foods for you. And we get an affiliation uh, revenue share on the, on the foods that are delivered. Um, Who's the team? So you already know me. Uh, my co-founder Jonathan is an uh, electrical engineer. I studied uh, industrial engineering. Um, we both have a background in, in sports. I am a nutritionist and um, athletic coach with more than 10 years of experience. I worked during my studies. Uh, Jonathan uh, has over seven years of experience in that area. Um, our core team is down there. Um, we have uh, three great developers. Jana is uh, with us from the beginning. Um, she started as a working student. Now she has a master's degree and is still working with us. And um, yeah, they are all nutrition trackers too. So basically the whole team is doing nutrition tracking and CrossFit together. So that's pretty cool for me. Great. Um, Thank you, Philo. I have to stop done. there. Yeah, we, we should go to the Q&A session. Uh, Wahid, the like last slide. This time. What did you think? Oh, yeah. Um, thanks a lot. This was a uh, very cool, but first input for me would be on differentiation. So obviously I feel like the, it's a very crowded market. I immediately think of CGMs, 
all other kinds of um, food trackers. So somehow that would be cool to understand um, how you differentiate. And then the other thing would be on the device. Like I'd love to hear a little bit more on the device. And maybe one last point is that uh, the, the aspect I like is this uh, partnership with uh, supermarket chains. I feel like recently in this same event, there was a clear bio uh, startup pitching, which which had a similar uh, partnership in place. And that was uh, one um, um, aspect I liked. So yeah, mm -hmm. that's about it. Yes, of course. Uh, so uh, let me start with um, how we differentiate from the from other competitors in the market. Um, so the thing is, all the nutrition tracking services out there, all of the nutrition monitoring services out there, require manual data input. So even if you have a, a really expensive subscription on Noom, which help you to uh, understand your eating behaviors better, they still need to know what you're eating and when you're eating it and how you're eating it. So we always have the same process. You always have to put everything you're eating and consuming onto kitchen scales, measure the amounts, and then manually type it into your app, scan the barcode, for example, if you have packaged foods, and then you create your own nutrition diary basically completely manually. So it's it's not, not faster than writing it down uh, with pen and paper or using a spreadsheet or so. It's really, really inconvenient. Um, and what we are di doing different is we are automatizing the whole process. So we are, we are automatizing the data generation process, which makes it much easier and with a lot less friction for the people to, um, to get the data they need where everything else is based on. So to, to make this, to streamline the process for the customer, you need to automatize the data generation process because people love convenience. Uh, people pay a lot of money for convenience. So let's do it convenient for them. That's, that's our approach uh, in that point. And then we have the data and then we can do things with it. We can, we can, um, help the customer with the data by interpreting the data for them and under, and um, supporting them. We can also synchronize the data with, for example, their doctor or their therapist or their, their nutritionist. So we can close the loop then for them. And so that's that's what we want to do. Yeah. Uh, when it comes to the product itself, um, I'll go here. Um, you have the cutting board is removable. So you just remove it uh, as you like. You can clean it and put it back on. It's, it's floating on the on the scale. Um, we have different uh, types of wood also for different types of kitchens. And um, you just place foods on the left half. And, uh, and if you look at the touch screen, there's a camera um, that looks onto the cutting board and then um, recognize over an object detector what foods we place there. Uh, it also can read barcodes. You just place uh, the packaging uh, close to the, to the display and it scans the barcode and gives you the nutrition information based on that. And so you can just prepare while using the device like a normal cutting board. And then all the data gets automatically generated, synchronized. Uh, and the third question I didn't get, it was about Rebe, right? Yeah, it was just a point about uh, actually, if I think yeah. of uh, your value adds, I feel like it could be great either with consumer health or supermarket chains like that. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Um, Katarina? Yeah, thank you. So, um um I had asked all the question I had so yeah I don't, I've got one I've got one more so uh mm -hmm. concerning revenue so where do you stand exactly now and about the the margin you can expect mm -hmm. so at the moment we have like these 110,000 euros in pre-order value um they will convert to revenue when we deliver the devices next month so in June we will start the devices then we have officially the 110,000 euros in in revenue um based on that um the app launched in um end of uh, February. And uh, we are planning to um, monetize on the app in the second half of uh, of the year. So we're starting building the, the premium products at the moment with Rewe together um, to monetize on that. Um, so we plan to have a revenue by the end of the year of about 500,000 euros, 400, let's say, go back 480, 440, 484,000 uh, euros um, by the end of the year. Um, and we have also a part of revenue that is not recurring um, that will add up on that because we sell the, the cutting surfaces too. They are not recurring, of course, but um, it's also a, an, added, an added product, an upsell on that point. Um, yeah. Did I forget something about your question? I'm not sure. It's about margin levels. You can expect. Margin levels. Yeah. Um, so at the moment, we can build the device in the small uh, amounts. We can build them with 1,000 pieces per batch for 250 euros per device that, that's how we how much we pay for them to build them um it will go down to about 150 euros uh, within um a number increase of 5000 euros um 
per batch or per um per half year so depending on the on the periods we're producing um so if we produce 5000 or more devices we'll come closer to 150 euros um and if we scale up more it will get even cheaper um we're producing also in in Europe so most of the parts are from Germany um and from Switzerland so most of them are created here and manufactured here um that's why we can proudly say we're designed in Germany and made in Europe yeah great thank you uh, time is almost up um actually mm -hmm. so i don't think we should have one more question okay. thanks so much philo yeah, thank you very much yeah thanks uh can i just ask how many users you have currently on the platform uh on the we have uh 410 i think at the moment and uh yes when we're now starting with the advertisement uh during the next weeks and then we will see how how this ramps up so the foreign our organic growth Okay, great. Thank you, Philo. Great to have you with us. Feel free to reach out to him after the events to learn more about it. And the next company, the next page is Alzheimer's Treatment Center of America. Uh, Doug will uh, share the opportunity with us. Doug, feel free to share your screen or Gregory. I see the screen now, but we don't hear you right now, Gregory. I, you don't, okay, sorry. I thought you had me muted. Um, so Greg Buckley, Alzheimer's Treatment Centers America. We use artificial intelligence uh, to treat, diagnose and then treat Alzheimer's. Um, Alzheimer's obviously is a very huge disease, five, 6.7 million Americans and 55 million people around the world with it. Um, the AI determined there's about 200 root causes of Alzheimer's. Uh, and we use the AI to help determine which of those root causes each person has. The typical person has 30 of these root causes that develop over 10, 20, 30 years. And obviously people say, well, what if big pharma invents a drug? Well, they spent $40 billion on 400 failed drug trials because you know, one drug isn't going to cure 200 root causes, if you will. And we have treatments for the root causes. Um, does it work? Yes. 75 in an observational study that was done, 75% of the patients had no further decline in their mild cognitive impairment. And some of those 75% started improving in their cognitive scores. Uh, so yes, very exciting results. Uh, we're looking to roll it out across the United States and the world. Uh, how do we do this? Well, first is the analytics. Again, with data, 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 we go right down to people's DNA. We get more laboratory testing done, more uh, gut health testing. We get all of that plus their DNA, plus incredible family history, feed it up into the AI. We get a report back about 30 pages in a couple of days. Um, then our practitioners take that and go, yes, yes, no, no, change this. Then we create a 15 page report for the patient. Say, hey, Mrs. Jones, yes, we found the 30 things wrong with your mom, but here are the top six. And here we've got programs to help you do this with uh, chronic care management systems, remote patient monitoring, uh, dietitians, and health coaches. Plus we've structuralized our business where our practitioners can spend three hours with the patient during the first month versus most businesses, you know, clinics are, they get about five minutes to eight minutes with the patient is all. We have a crazy good team. Uh, I'm a Harvard Business School grad. I uh, was a vice president of PepsiCo. I was president of Progressive Auto Insurance Company, the largest auto insurer in the United States. I did a turnaround for one of the largest KKR, the one of the largest turnaround uh, buyout firms in the world. And about nine years ago, I decided to get into medicine to, uh, you know, basically be in an industry that gives back. And um, the uh, we have five other HBS grads, Duke, Harvard, you know, we got a team. And then we have seven world-class doctors, two Harvard doctors, uh, Emory Re Alzheimer's researcher, and a lot of other skilled people. So uh, because everybody cares about this disease, we can attract a crazy good team. The market's huge, 355 billion in just the United States, 1.5 trillion in the world. We are targeting the upper income groups, the green spot, 
And the pro forma I'm going to share with you is less than 2% market share of the, just, just the green target for the United States. Our unit economics are amazing. Uh, most businesses in medicine would be the fourth bullet point there. Office visits, 1.3 million. We have 10 times that scale economy because we've added in five additional verticals. Those additional verticals all have EBITDA margins of greater than 50%, whereas the base EBITDA margins are typically bad, down around 5%. So we have our own lab, uh, we have remote patient monitoring, insurance cover modalities, and then we have the cash side. So we're about half cash for each patient and about half insurance covered. We are in network with all the US insurance cup carriers. We'll roll it out quickly, 123 clinics in five years. Some people say, oh, that's fast. Well, I used to run a quarter, I used to run a Pizza Hut system and I opened a hundred Pizza Huts in uh, two years. So no, it's, if you know how to do it, it's very doable. Uh, we're not, and we've got four clinics uh, slated to open starting uh, next month actually, and uh, during this calendar year. Um, and if you notice the cash at the end of the year, it's $11 million because we're cash on cash positive within two months for each clinic opening. We're only talking about raising $10 million here and we're immediately cash flow positive. And if you notice the $426 million of cash at the end of the year in five years, we're not going to sit there with that much cash. We're going to open a lot more than the 123 clinics. Um, we're not a biotech high risk. Uh, there's no more R&D to prove out. Uh, we open company clinics. Uh, it's capital light, and um, I've doubled practitioner pay to make sure we can hire anybody we want to hire. Uh, we're opening in Port St. Lucie uh, in Southeast Florida in June, Atlanta in August, uh, Naples, Florida in October, and Palm Beach, Florida. You notice those are fairly wealthy zip code areas. Uh, this is what we're doing. We're raising $10 million. Um, and we're doing it on a convertible note with a 20% discount to the, for, to the priced round. If we haven't done a priced round within three years, we'll do a uh, fair market valuation. That'll be the priced round. And we're putting a cap on this thing of $50 million. Uh, one clinic at $5.7 million of EBITDA is worth you know, $57 million at just 10 times EBITDA. So again, those are gonna be opening very quickly. But we, so we think our next priced round is going to be in the three, four, yeah. five hundred. Thank you, Gregory. Uh, yeah. I'll stop you there. Thanks so much for the great presentation. Um, Jill, would you like to start? Do you have any comments or question to Gregory? Uh, sure, yeah. Uh, I think the one thing is, are you, I know a lot of this focus is on the higher income areas because they have the financial means to provide extra support to this patient population. Is there any strategy when we think about like health disparities of having a way to open this up to other people with Alzheimer's who do not have the same financial means? We do. We have one a member of our team who is actually with Medicare at a very high level. He'll be joining our team uh, in June. We're going to be gathering data, proving the efficacy of this, and then going back to Medicare to try to get a lot of the treatment programs covered by insurance. We'll also start up a charitable foundation uh, down the road. Uh, and plus, with scale economies, we'll be able to bring the cost of delivery down. Okay. And so you're thinking about reimbursement strategy through Medicare. Are there current CPT codes in place that you'll need to utilize or will you need to create new codes? Yeah, no, no. We've we've billed six, 700,000 to Medicare, Medicaid, uh, all the other insurance companies over the last two, three years during our alpha beta testing and stuff like that. And they paid it. You know, it's, it, these are very common codes for what we're billing. Nothing exotic. Yeah, thank you, Jill. Uh, Marcus, do you have any question? Yeah, thanks for the great overview. Um, in terms of, so, so what is actually then the USP? What do you really do different in terms of, I mean, we know treatments are limited, so how do you provide the benefit? So um, first of all, we identify, we've got about 50 different modalities. We've got about 100 different IV formulas. We've got some proprietary, um, actually, uh, compassionate use drugs we have available to us. We have um, some amazing leading edge, um, if you will, modalities that we use that other people are not using in the space. Yeah, thank you, Marcus. Um, Wahid? Uh, thanks a lot, Greg. 
Um, honestly, to me, this feels like a, an, an execution play in building mental health uh, clinics rather than um, um, uh, innovative AI startup uh, type of thing. Uh, but my question was um, how you view uh, the new monoclonal antibody or everything that's happening in the space. Maybe you've heard of a company called Cognito Therapeutics. Uh, trying to do something in the space, maybe a comment on how you plan to integrate uh, new treatment modalities. So we we have every possible prescription drug built into the AI, and we'll utilize it when appropriate. But some of the new you know some of the new drugs have a twenty percent risk of brain bleed if you use them. So we don't we have that was to break up plaque. We have a way to break up plaque using radio waves with zero side effects. Mm -hmm. So yes, they're all incorporated and we'll use them. And like I say, there's a compassionate use drug that we have access to that we are uh, very positive about. But that when you've got typically 30 root causes, one drug doesn't solve it. You've got to have a comprehensive game plan uh, for this. And so, yeah, no, we're very different than any typical mental health clinic. It feels like a holistic, some type of holistic AI treatment for a very rich or high net worth individuals. I mean, well, we stay away from the word holistic because that feels touchy feely. We are so scientifically, we are so scientifically driven. We are more scientist driven than anybody can believe. Now, just so you guys understand, the AI protocol has been vetted by the Cleveland Clinic here in the United States. And they have chosen to use this for their Lou Revo Center in uh, Las Vegas. So yes, this there's no doubt that this AI is a is a true tool. Maybe one last. Uh, sorry, uh, yeah. there was recently news about Walmart uh, closing their primary care clinics. Can you just share some, uh, like, or give a piece of intel on how you plan to execute um, operating um, clinics? I mean, just some high level overview. We, we, we will open our own clinics. We will hire the practitioners and roll it out ourselves. Uh, we will not use franchisees, we're not franchise system. Brand control, data control, quality control. I mean, we don't even speak to the deck, but the data that we're gathering is gonna be worth hundreds of millions and billions of dollars actually. Uh, but yeah, we'll do it all ourselves, um, And that's why I put in twice market rate to hire people. The margins are there, you know, it cut my margins back a couple percent when I went, but it's still 44% EBITDA, so who cares kind of a thing. Do you have any concerns that your data though is gonna be skewed since you're going to get primarily a white population? Uh, let's put this, in the short term, it, it will be what it will be. Uh, we're not trying to necessarily prove out efficacy. The AI has already has hundreds of millions of records in it, okay? So this isn't about, you know, generating the efficacy of it. This is about using the AI that's been generated by an equal distribution of population based on the hundreds of millions of records in it. Yeah. Great, time is almost up, unless anyone wants to say I want to add something to that. Perhaps just a quick question for yeah. uh, for for Greg. So everything will be about execution and this plan, and uh, pro perhaps some view on how kind of exit can you expect? Yeah, we Greg, expect I need a very an short IP, answer to that. Yeah, IPO in uh, three to four years, or uh, or a private equity firm or a healthcare company buying us up. But, you know, liquidity event in three to four year time frame. Great. Thanks so much. Great. Great presentation. Yep. Great answer. Um, thank thank you. you. And uh, next company, next presentation is Amato. Uh, Karsten will present the opportunity. Let's see. Full screen. Yes. It should now work, I think. Fantastic. 30% yeah. of you will suffer from a life-altering immune disease. But will you get it? When will you get it? How severe will it be? And how your doctor should treat your unique immune system? Today, your doctor is shooting in the dark with respect to these questions. But the answers can be found in your blood. Your blood is a unique window into your immune system. And the way to 
assess the immune system, take a snapshot, is called cytometry, measuring up to millions of cells, and really capturing a high dimensional uh, data profile of each of these blood cells. It's already been used for decades as a critical tool from bench to bedside, whether in the COVID trials or in cancer diagnostics. And of course, this is a multi-billion dollar market complementary to genetics. If DNA gives you the blueprint, then cytometry kind of tells you what the immune system is actually built, what's actually present in your blood. But cytometry analysis today is really holding back precision immune medicine. As you can see in this video of our incumbent today, cytometry analysis is really, really manual. People will click their way through this high dimensional uh, complex data, causing staff shortages of this increasingly uh, rare skill. But also it's very subjective. There's actually a known fact with an average 30%, 30% variability, but also it, even the raw data data is not reproducible. So if, if you send your blood to Boston and Berlin, the data in these two different workflows comes out looking totally differently. Even more so, the number of cytometry tests is doubling every decade, but also the amount of data, so the complexity, uh, the richness per, per cell that you measure is also doubling every decade. And these two compounding exponential effects, we really think create the perfect opportunity for finally delivering an AI powered revolution to cytometry and uh, adds both the automation, but also the precision medicine component to cytometry. And that is the future we are building with Hemato, enabling the era of automated precision cytometry with our CE marked uh, browser-based AI products that is automated. So with a few clicks going from that device raw data to diagnostic report, making staff shortages a thing of the past, but also finally making that objective so that you and your doctor can rely on these test results, but also finally unlocking that holy grail of immunology, making cytometry reproducible, making the data come out the same and making the data speak. We've really sought out the best partners in the world to unlock this dream. So whether it's in the clinical studies or in clinical deployment, we're partnering with University of Louisiana, UPenn, Stanford, and even, uh, even NIST to uh, build that dream of, of scalable uh, precision AI cytometry. And we're going about that in a really systematic way, conquering the market, starting with high volume routine diagnostic testing, where we're now doing our second rollout with additional labs uh, uh, waiting for us. Uh, of course, with the necessary regulatory approvals, and then going into building those novel diagnostics for that personalization of immune medicine, which will be very powerful for clinical trials and, uh, and biopharma. Since our seed round about a year ago, we've really built the, the team with all the skills in cytometry, regulatory tech, and sales needed to win and to own cytometry. Um, and now we're raising our 8 million Series A round with already 3 million committed to bring the first novel diagnostic to market to enable that personalization of immune medicine to scale the product by over 20 of X, including US sales operations and an FDA approval. And finally, a first deal with uh, or for a, a clinical trial. I would like you to imagine a world whereby not just diagnostic error is reduced to zero, but even your treatment plan is personalized to your unique immune system. That is the world we are enabling with hematome. Thank you. Great. Thanks so much, um, Karsten. So Katerina, would you like to start? Yeah, thank you. So perhaps I missed something about the, the funds you already raised and the, the amount you need to, to raise now and for doing what? Sorry for that. Um, I'm just starting conversations for our Series A round of eight million mm -hmm. with with three million committed, and uh, we want to achieve three things with that. So currently, we are commercially deployed, so we really want to scale that by over twenty five x to really have have significant revenue uh, with the Series A uh, uh, financing, and then second, also build that 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 first uh, novel diagnostic and bring it to market. Uh, we're now doing a large study with a number of centers, including Stanford, to test that, but really to bring it to market and commercialize that. And finally, to engage with a contract research organization, CRO, to uh, get a first commercial engagement for a clinical trial. Okay. Yep. Thank you, Katerina. Um, Marcus, do you have any question? Yeah, thanks. Um, yeah, I, I heard your pitch before, so I'm, I'm fairly familiar, but 
how is actually the availability of flow cytometers in let's say not so high end hospitals because i mean you you kind of depend on that i assume to give a good diagnosis yeah uh, that's a great, great question so in um a clinic of a doctor typically this is not being done but in every hospital so with these larger buildings um if there's a lab they do have cytometry so even in you know not the huge hospitals but in kind of a medium size or even smaller hospital they they do do cytometry this is not isolated to you know, Brigham or, or, or Mayo, this is also done in, you know, Munich or a number of hospitals, uh, in every city you'll, you'll find hospitals with, with cytometry. Thank you. Um, Jill, do you have anything sure. to add? So just first to dovetail off of that. So is the business model will pretty much sales directly to labs, sales directly to hospitals. What is kind of the approach um, are you going to be working and selling to academic centers as well? Since we do, you know, right during my PhD, I spent a lot of time doing flow because I was an immunologist by training. Um, where are you thinking about the, where the consumer business will go? Yeah, I would love to have a conversation, by the way, to you, since you have a background in cytometry, always love to speak to cytometrists. So uh, we are engaging with also uh, academic hospitals, as I kind of uh, tried to show on on, uh, on on this slide. I mean, Stanford is, of course, an academic center. Brigham is part of Harvard Medical School. Uh, so also academic centers. Right now, we are really targeting, um, for commercial reasons, private labs, um, trying to not go into the hospital space right now. That will be kind of a follow-on market uh, for reasons I'm happy to go into. And uh, that's our beachhead uh, market. It's the private um, hematology laboratory. And after that, we would target CROs that do clinical trials for biopharma, like for COVID, for immunological diseases, um, and also for, of course, uh, pediatric diseases, of course, which are inactive in yourself. So first labs and then going into CROs. Okay. And then I think my second question is just kind of understanding how you're setting up the parameters for identifying cell populations, because you're a, a thousand percent right. You can give myself the same flow analysis to analyze and like someone else, even in my same lab with the same machine on the same uh, data set. And we'll have slightly different variations in the population that we are determining, even if it's like, uh, oh, we're just looking for a, you know, macrophage population, for instance. So are you guys creating uh, like gates that are set to like identify each of these populations? And what level of like subtype differentiation have you created so you can apply this within a lot of the autoimmune population that you highlighted you want to treat? Yeah, so so we have two components. The first is indeed that we have uh, a curated database with with gates, as they're called, these annotations that you that you that you spoke of. Um, but more so than that, we're actually uh, building something quite novel that that maybe will excite you with your background in cytometry, namely to make the data standardized. This has of course been uh, a dream so far in cytometry. Can you actually make the data come out the same whether you ship it to again to Boston or Berlin? And actually we've built a prototype that this can be done. So we actually have an AI algorithm, uh, which I'm happy to show to you where the data comes out the same um, uh, across different workflows. That's right now a prototype. So it's not yet uh, you know, an FDA approved thing, but we're bringing that to the level of an, of an MVP, a minimum, minimum viable product with some of these labs that I've, I've spoke, spoken about. And that will really enable, of course, uh, finally making this a quantitative diagnostic, right? Now being, being very qualitative, if you can standardize the data, you can really make cytometry a precision diagnostic. So that, that is the approach besides those gates, which at some point will be outdated. It's really about standardizing the raw data and making the data reproducible. Yeah, I think this will be very interesting, especially with uh, some of the CAR-T plays. For instance, I've seen when you're trying to isolate like memory, uh, effective memory T cells, this could be a much more standardized and easy way to do it as well. Yeah, that's a great point. Just to tag on to that, of course, uh, uh, therapies like CAR-T, once they get to deployed to the clinic, you need monitoring tools to check whether these patients are responding in the right way and monitor that CAR population. Today, that's very, very fragile, right? So the analytics is really increasingly becoming a bottleneck for these novel therapies. And someday there'll have to be a platform that enables this immune monitoring for CAR-T and for other therapies, tumor infiltrating lymphocytes, you name it. And we just want to be that platform that that really enables millions of people to have you know the best monitoring available, precise diagnosis, and personalizing uh, your therapy. Thank you, thank you, Jill Wahid. Any question from your side? Uh, great pitch, Karsten. 
Um, maybe uh, for somebody completely naive or uh, new to the field, it would be great to understand if you could share some feedback from uh, hemato oncologists who've um, potentially used or uh, seen the software. And why I'm referring to this, it's usually for me important to understand whether this is something that just um, uh, automatizes uh, routine um, workflow, so something they're not happy to do or just uh, don't want to spend time on, or is it actually something pushing boundaries in terms of detecting new stuff, pushing detection or sensitivity? That'd be great. Yeah. I think it also goes back to the question of, of Jill, right, uh, about the number of immune cell populations. So the, the thing that we commercialize, so for these private labs, is really automate boring work. They're stressed out. They have piles of, of cases they want to want to process. They work until 8 p.m. They just want to get that work done faster. People are going into retirement. So really kind of it's a stress on the laboratory system. Uh, that is the thing that we, we commercialize and that labs are primarily interested in. That will change, of course, once we go into, for example, uh, CAR-T monitoring, as, as Jill pointed out. And we believe that much of the potential of the cytometry platform is much bigger than simply automating um, labor time. It's really in personalizing that it, uh, immune medicine. That's why we're doing these studies with, with Stanford, with, with, with Brigham, with UPenn, to say, can we actually, for example, predict your risk profile of your immune system um, and will you make it a precision diagnostic? And then it will push the boundaries and, and again, change cytometry away from a qualitative to a quantitative uh, precision platform. Um, so kind of going from automation into, into uh, pushing the boundaries, it's kind of a two-step process. Great. Thank you, Karsti, for the presentation. Um, thank, thank you, you so guys. much for joining us. Thank you. Thank you. And the next company is Oncobit. Claudio will present the opportunity. Thank you. Uh, Thank you. Also for having me. Um, you guys can hear me and see my screen? Yes. That's great. Um, so I'm Claudia. I'm a biochemist by training. I um, worked for 10 years in biomedical research after my PhD, and I'm now very excited to use my skills towards our vision of enabling personalized cancer care. So I probably don't have to tell this audience that it's not so easy to treat cancer. And that's why typically every cancer is um, searched for what kind of markers the cancer the patient has to really then choose the right therapy. But despite this knowledge, cancer patients need to be very tightly monitored. And I'm showing here the standard of care, which is typically done via imaging. And that's very powerful in localizing where the cancer is, right? But at the same time, if you talk to a physician, up to 90% of these scans are negative. And so that means they are not used because you need to localize the cancer. They're used out of because there is no better alternatives out there. And when getting these scans, patients are exposed to a lot of unnecessary radiation, but at the same time, they are also not the most specific. So for example, if you have a COVID vaccination or if you have some inflammatory reactions in your body, these scans will also turn positive. And so that was sort of the starting point why we um, founded Oncobit. We are a spinner from the University Hospital of Zurich. Um, two of my co-founders are still professors there. And so we saw this unmet need um, firsthand. And so instead of relying on imaging, we use the fact that when cancer cells spread through the body or when the cancer um, spreads, um, cancer DNA is released into the bloodstream. And this cancer um, circulating tumor DNA, we can de then detect um, based on our scalable and also data-driven monitoring platform that we've built around digital PCR for an optimal therapy management. And so the big advantage of using digital PCR is that it's very quantitative and it allows us to really specifically detect a, a marker that we know the patient has um, and follow that marker over time. And because we only focus on one marker, it's a very cost and time effective solution and enables a very tight monitoring. The problem with these very sensitive technologies is that um, the data analysis and interpretation is not very trivial and is typically not standardized. And this is exactly also where our USP lies. We have developed a proprietary software that is trained on our essays, on our kits, and, and that allows on one hand a robust and interpretable data um, analysis, and, uh, analysis, but at the same time, it also allows us to enable hospitals to perform the tests themselves by maintaining high quality standards. And this makes also our platform quite scalable. So where we have an initial focus on, alone, on melanoma, it's very um, scalable um, to other cancer types. And in fact, we've already um, generated now prototypes um, for colorectal cancer. 
And the product itself consists of these two um, components that I already mentioned, essays and, and software. We do have a patent pending um, on the software side, and we already have regulatory approval for a first marker for melanoma. Um, and we're actually expecting approval for all melanoma markers within the next month. And with that, we really want to enable this very tight monitoring of um, the disease um, guide imaging. We, of course, will never replace it because we can't localize the cancer, but we want to provide a less invasive and a tighter monitoring for our data-driven therapy management and also ultimately an earlier treatment adjustment. The cancer market um, is expected to grow quite a bit, as you um, are probably, I'm sure, all familiar with um, because of the growing preference for more personalized medicine and the accompanying need for more precise monitoring. And for melanoma, we have an addressable um, um, SAM, well, SAM of 70 million. Um, as soon as we expand to colorectal, um, this um, accounts for about 300 million, um, but that's just the starting point. So I already mentioned that the platform is quite scalable, which is why we want to generate more than 50 million revenues in 2028. I already mentioned um, imaging, um, sometimes unspecific markers are currently measured in the routine um, or in, in, is our part of the standard of care. And there are more traditional PCR approaches out there, um, but what's really lacking here is the standardized data analysis. And then from the US, we hear more and more about these tumor informed sequencing approaches, which are very elegant, but they're very, very time and cost effective. And our solution really provides a great alternative if you have a specific marker that you can follow. Um, our main um, customer segments are hospitals. Um, we are now implemented in the first hospital in the routine um, in Switzerland, uh, where we are already reimbursed. Um, typically, these hospitals have um, the existing infrastructure in place where our solution runs on. And so that means that hospitals can generate the data themselves, upload them in our, our cloud um, infrastructure, where it's then automatically analyzed and interpreted. Um, Something I have not mentioned is that our segment, second customer contract uh, segment is a pharma industry. And so we actually also already closed our first pharma contract. And um, so that's our second revenue stream. The big advantage here is of course, we don't need regulatory approval and we don't need reimbursement. Um, in Germany, we want to enter the market by contracts with um, health insurances. Initially um, in the US, we want to partner with a CLIA lab to enter the market prior to FDA approval. And um, yes, I already mentioned that we're already expanding to other cancer types. We have a fantastic team that's making all of this happen, um, kind of also reflecting the dual components of our products. And um, so software developers and people with more biology diagnostic background, we are already ISO 13485 certified since more than two years. Um, and Sandra joined us from, um, from the clinic. And um, so she's working on the studies. And um, Björn, our CBO, has more than 12 years of marketing sales and business development experience. Um, and we also have very experienced advisors um, who, who support us. Great. Thank you, Claudio. I have to stop you there. Yeah. That's so I think I'll just leave this open then. <laughs> okay, then. Uh, Marcus, we have to start. Do you think? Yeah, thank you. Um, in, in terms of... Um, so you are in the cancer monitoring space, right? You're mm -hmm. not doing diagnostic. No. Like the, the big screening, like Gray, no. like he likes. Yeah. Exactly. Um, how is your plan further that because i mean at some point i guess uh, you need to run certain clinical trials to actually show or like prove the sensitivity how, how is your plan on that because this, i mean we have seen from those us players this is like massive huge trials you need to be you need to run them prospectively so what are your plans around that yeah, so we actually just um, put together our 12-month interim analysis for a big pros um, pros prospective study. Um, we're also expanding this right now to multiple centers. Um, so we initially started with the University Hospital of Zurich, but we also now have um, some hospitals in Germany on board. And so we are at the moment, we are also getting really large retrospective um, cohorts, and it all comes down right on how these retrospective cohorts actually look like. So for example, uh, the Charité, Hamburg, we even got now samples also from MGH um, in Boston. Um, so that together actually really helps us to, to, to look at that. Um, because the, for us, the, the biggest challenge is actually to what do we correlate it with? Because imaging is not perfect, right? So if we only correlate our data to imaging, um, it's a little bit misleading because we know that imaging can be false positive or false negative. So, um, and of course, the big advantage of retrospective cohorts is that right we have longer, more long-term outcome data. Um, what we've so far demonstrated is 100% specificity across um, all cancer stages, um, and we've so far analyzed more than 500 patients and 1,700 samples through prospective and retrospective studies. 
Yeah, thank you for answering, Claudio. Um, Jill, any question from your side? Sure, yeah. Um, look, I think I, I love looking at circulating tumor DNA as an approach for diagnostics. This is really, you know, since 2017, really grown into an excellent way. And prostate cancer has kind of led the stage of how you can do this. But there are a significant number of companies using circulating tumor DNA. So the first part of my question is, how do you look at differentiating yourself from like uh, foundation medicine has the foundation one tracker, or like Nick Tara's Signatera in colorectal cancer, among many other companies that are out there, you know, doing similar models. Yeah. Uh, and the second piece is how do you approach becoming, you know, the gold standard uh, compared to PET CT? Yeah. So in terms of um, competitors, so for example, what you mentioned foundation, right? So these are always large panels. So they are fantastic to initially characterize what kind of CTDNA do you have? Um, does the patient have what kind of mutation? What's the mutational profile? It's also important when you want to characterize resistance where you expect new mutations. But if you want to tightly monitor a patient you and you work with such a large panel as the one from foundation or so, it's just not very practical. Um, because it costs a fortune and it's less sensitive because it's um it's more comprehensive. Um, so that's compared to these larger panels. Um, and then the other approach, those are the tumor-informed approaches, like Natera, for example. Very elegant, but if you talk to physicians, they have to wait one and a half months for a result. And it's very oh. expensive, and it's just not. Again, if you really just want to follow a marker, which we've quite some data now that suggests that this is sufficient to just follow a single marker that we know the patient has, then our solution is just so much more time and cost effective compared to these, you know, more comprehensive and 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 I agree more elegant approaches. But if you don't need them, right? Like it's it's just a it's a burden on the healthcare system in the, at this stage. Um, and then. Um, in terms of um, comparing to the standard of care. So in all the studies that we're running right now, both prospective and retrospective, we're always comparing our um, yeah, our our values to what we get out of imaging. And so um, that's, as again, like, right, we can't assume that imaging is always right. And that's why it's important um, to actually look at the outcome ultimately. Um, and that's why these studies take some time as well. So right now at the moment, our solution is, for example, in, in, in at the University Hospital of Zurich, it's implemented for certain use cases. Um, but to, of course, to broadly roll it out, we need that data that we're currently generating. And that's also what why we're raising uh, three to five million Series A. Thank you. Thank you, thank you Jill. Wahid? Uh, yeah. So uh, my first question was um, about... Uh, I'd call them uh, bottlenecks of expanding to other indications. So is it just uh, like verifying a good enough set of markers that could work for an application? Other, like, can, could you maybe expand on that? Like, how would you plan to um, go to colorectal, et cetera? And then the second one was you mentioned uh, CLIA. Are, you, are your plans affected by the recent FDA, LDT, uh, cracked on or regulation on labs developed in uh, CLIA prior to uh, CLIA labs prior to FDA approval. Yeah, so it gets also in the US, it gets more and more challenged. And so we are affected by this. Um, at the moment, it still offers us a route to market entry, but um, we will definitely also pursue FDA approval because of that. Um, the um, um, first question, um, sorry, I'm not blanking. Um, I was I, I was just wondering about bottlenecks or challenges when expanding to other indications. Ah, yes, yeah, sorry. So creating. Yeah. So the so the software part is actually. By the way, SA... we don't have much time, so we we need a short answer for it, Claudia. Yeah. So the software is essay agnostic, and then it's just adding essentially like another marker. But we have the same development process for adding additional markers. So we just generated prototypes for nine additional markers within a few months. We need to still add more data, but um, it's it's quite fast on our side. Amazing. Thank you. Yeah, thanks so much, Claudia. Great presentation. Feel free to reach out to her after the conference to learn more about it. Thank you, Claudia. And the next company, the next page is Sandens. Robert will present the opportunity. OK. So, hi. Did you know that more than 10 million people worldwide have to use prosthetic limbs? 
And unfortunately, this number is growing rapidly. Although the prosthetic limbs themselves are marvels of technology, the socket, that's the place where the prosthesis is attached to the human body, is just a dumb mechanical device. This is because it's individually shaped and flexible, always conforming to the human body. Up to now, there has been no possibility to efficiently integrate sensors into prosthetic sockets to make them smart. Our startup Sendens created a patented soft sensor technology, technology that changes this. For the first time, manufacturers of prosthetics can design, produce, and operate smart sockets interacting with the wearer to truly give amputees a feeling for the new limb. The Sendence Data Management Platform provides real-time quantitative information to make better socket design, improve device fit, and to add interactive AI features, helping amputees to better cope with their loss. The prosthetic socket is just an example for devices that Sendence can make smart. There is a potential of 10,000 manufacturers of mechanical devices in healthcare and sports that have no suitable technology to make them smart. These form a 3.5 billion market opportunity for Sendence. Just as an example, there are 3 million custom-made shoes for diabetics per year produced in Germany alone. Sendence partners with a leading manufacturer to provide 100,000 smart insoles per year that have the potential to avoid 10,000 foot amputations. We have already 24 leading manufacturers as pilot customers with more than 150,000 euros in revenue secured and a lot more in negotiation. These pilot projects qualify perfect enterprise customers that will create serious products with our technology. During the entire product lifetime, Sendence generates recurring revenue with software platform licenses, as well as sensor component sales. Our most direct competitors, such as Mayant or Sensoria, suffer from complex design and production setup routines, so they cannot service uh, most of our target customers, while the patented Sendence technology enables a unique and highly scalable solution we call Smart Product as a Service. In the last three years, Sendence raised more than 2.5 million euros in funding, built up a strong team in technology and sales, and is currently enabling first series products that will enter the market this year. To boost our growth, we are currently raising a seed round that will bring us to more than 3 million ARR by the end of next year, with a solid growth targeting over 100 million annual revenue by 2029. The diverse and complementary founding team of Sendence combines many years of experience in entrepreneurship, project management, biomechanics, and financial controlling with a great passion for supporting people to stay mobile despite age, disease, or accident. I wish you all the best, but if something bad should happen to you or someone you, you know, uh, we have got the tools to keep you active. Thank you very much. Great, thank you, Robert. Uh, Katerina, what did you think? Let's yeah, th thanks for your offer, but please, uh, not for now, for me. <laughs> <laughs> I um, hope not. Uh, perhaps the, the question, so it's, uh, as far as I understand, is a license model. So um, the the question is, what? how can you explain to us the exit strategy for the company? So the, the, the point is that we will be a supplier for sensor component, for key components, mm -hmm. a long-term supplier, and licensing the software platform. And the exit strategy is uh, either going towards um, a merchant acquisition with a large healthcare company that wants the data that we own, uh, that is generated by the devices with our technology, or uh, being integrated into a, a major producer of smart wearables. The, concentration, the current uh, drive for concentration in the orthotics and prosthetics market is huge. Uh, engulfing also rehabilitation and, and nursing. Uh, so there will be big players appearing. It's uh, currently, there were a merger of three large companies, Asur, uh, Fior and Gens in Germany, uh, to a multi-billion dollar company that's competing with Otto Bock, the big company that's currently in the space. And there will be much more to come. And they're gobbling up clinics like, like crazy and growing very fast. So there will be extremely big players that are candidates for uh, an M and A deal uh, with a technology provider like us. Thank you, Robert. Thank you, Catherine. Anything to add? 
No, okay, Jill, do you have any question? Sure. Um, I think at the beginning, like you started to highlight how the technology is able to read into, I'm guessing it's like some of the weight and pressure distribution of patients. Cause I, you know, uh, I've rotated a lot within the VA healthcare system. We work with a lot of veterans with prosthesis and, you know, uh, phantom limb pain, having to refit prosthesis with major like wounds and infections is a really, really big problem. Um, so can you explain a little bit more of what what the AI is specifically doing and what kind of readout you're doing to make the prosthesis a better fit? Yeah, our main workhorse are pressure sensors, but we can also do humidity, strain, um, temperature, and also position uh, that gives a feedback on, on the exact uh, 3D positioning of, of the system. And uh, But mostly it's the pressure sensors that uh, show the pressure distribution, uh, both static and dynamic, and also in everyday use uh, to enable uh, um, uh, adjusting, self-adjusting socket. First, in the first thing, a better fit of the socket in the beginning uh, trial stages where the socket is fit. And then later also a self-adjusting socket because a huge problem is that the amputation stump is changing in volume all the time due to temperature changes, due to hormonal changes with women. It's really a huge problem, uh, but also on a longer term scale uh, due to atrophying of muscles and, and rearranging of, of muscles and of scar tissue uh, evolving. And the, the holy grail is, so to say, the self-adjusting socket. And that's where we're working together with Blatchford on. Blatchford is a big prosthetics company in Britain with a strong presence in the US market also. And this is how you see yourself distinguishing from, say, like 3D printing, because uh, I've seen a lot within the orthopedic models of utilizing 3D printing more, so you get the exact replication of the person's anatomy. Uh, we are working together with 3D printing. So we are providers of the sensors of this interactive element. A 3D printed socket is still a dumb device that cannot that is once fabricated and cannot react uh, to, to, to what's happening. So what we are bringing into it is this interactivity. It's not a one one time construction of the device. It's making the device smart, making it interactive, feeling, uh, you know, also recovering the lost feeling of the patient. So do you currently have strategic partnerships with specific 3D printing, like you mentioned? Uh... Uh, we are having strategic partnerships with the big ones, uh, with Ottobock, uh, Blatchford. These are the big producers of prosthetics and orthotics. RAM is a huge clinic in Germany with 50 uh, subclinics uh, that are very specialized in diabetes care, a huge market opportunity. And they all build devices and they all want to have smart devices, you know, want to close this feedback loop with the patient. And that's what we can provide for them. Right. Thank you, Jill. Um, Wahid, do you have any question? Yeah, so this is really fascinating for me because if I just think on a daily basis in terms of uh, touching um, things, I'm, I'm talking about healthy people. It just feels like such a crazy source of um, information in terms of how we interact with um, objects. And I always feel like it could be um, like so much innovation in terms of product design, if you could in a way sense all and collect all that information. Uh, my question is about some, um, what's the craziest outcome of a technology like that? Like a, some, some type of science fiction exoskeleton. Can you, can you just give some, some type of speculation on what could happen using your stuff? I would give you two uh, two examples. One example is a current project we have with Gogoa, uh, a Spanish company that are building medical exoskeletons. And their vision is to make uh, paralyzed people walk again with exoskeletons, you know, the full stack. Uh, people that cannot walk get an exoskeleton and then they move uh, as free as possible. Uh, that's one thing. And for that, you need a lot of interactivity, you know, ground contact, gait patterns, uh, muscle activation patterns. And the second part uh, that uh, was picked by your first sentences is uh, we do have a glove uh, with uh, se pressure sensors in the fingertips and position sensors. So you can track the intricate finger movements and how, how strong you're gripping. And this is to digitize uh, manual uh, operations, this tactile information that uh, a healthcare professional gets when touching the patient. 
in orthotics and prosthetics, this plays a huge role. So for example, when you're fitting the prosthetic socket, you touch the, pay, the, the amputation stump, which is always completely individual and you cannot say exactly where the bones are or hard, you know, hard scar tissue. And with this glove, you just touch the right points and you get it immediately digitized as a basis for creating a 3D printed socket, for example. And this can be then outfitted with the sensors that uh, make the socket itself uh, interactive. That's also a very visionary uh, concept that the socket is always morphing to, to fit exactly, uh, you know, time of day and, and what the wearer is needing. You know, doing sports, it fits tighter, then getting more relaxed when you're sitting around, things like that. Very cool, thank you. Thank you, uh, Marcus. Do you have any question? Yeah, I'm just wondering. Um, so how do how do like the the manufacturers that produce these prosthetics actually create value with your solution? Because I mean, they have kind of the uh, these fixed rates that they get for making those and so on. So so how what incentivizes them to use it? Yeah, there are several several vectors. So one vector is uh, if you can reduce the time the professional needs to fit the device. That's a huge uh, leverage because these professionals are short in supply, uh, they are highly paid, and they are complete bottleneck on, on how many patients you can uh, serve. So if you help them in their work, uh, that all immediately pays off. Uh, a second thing is that now with, for example, the DIGA in Germany, there are new revenue, uh, you know, uh, new reimbursement models coming up that sometimes get easier, can be easier triggered if you have uh, quantitative measurement data in the back of the app that gets reimbursed. That's something we are doing, for example, with RAM. So the, 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 the sensors pay themselves uh, with, the, uh, with the reimbursement for the app that gives this feedback, closes feedback loop to the patient. And uh, additionally, it's also uh, that these large manufacturers, of course, have the levers to, uh, to, to, to include new functionalities in their product and then get the reimbursement uh, if they can prove the, the, the value to the healthcare system. But that's a longer route. Great. Thank you so much for the answer, Robert. Thank you for the question, okay. advisors. Time is up. Thank you. Maybe to reach out to Robert to learn more about it. Um, let's move to the next pitch. Next company is Coach Now. Andreas uh, will do the presentation. Yes. Hello, everybody. Can you see my presentation? Yes. Perfect. Yeah, I'm happy to be here today, and I hope I find all of you in a good mental state. Unfortunately, this is not a matter of course these days. Um, but don't worry. Um, I, I don't want to explain to you how highly relevant the topic of mental health is worldwide. You are all experts and you probably know the traumatic figures. But there is one important number that many people here may not yet know. 35% of people who seek help with mental health challenges do not want to speak face to face with a psychologist or therapist. They face feelings of shame or they are inhabited for various reasons. So we are talking um, in Europe, for example, about 150 million people for whom there's no suitable solution right now to support their mental health. The many matching platforms that you are probably familiar with do not address these people. Their business models and methods are primarily based on arranging classic one-to-one -one sessions or group sessions for the user. So you could say, wait a minute, but they also have a content library to be consumed on demand. And this is partly true, but there are two key aspects to bear in mind. Uh, first, mostly the content is of low quality and lacks profoundness, and it is usually contributed by average psychologists or even just by graphics, text, and animations. Second, the content is not personalized to the individual user. It tends to be one size fits all, or you have to search for yourself, like in a TV media library, for example. And as a result, the effectiveness of this content must definitely be questioned. And this brings us to the USPs of the innovative method we invented at CouchNow to help people with their mental health issues. At CouchNow, users can currently find over 300 videos lasting an average of 15 minutes from the very best experts in psychology, psychotherapy, and science. 
One example, Professor Dr. Burish, he's the leading expert for burn burnout in Europe. And studies show that the best psychologists are 12 times more effective than the average. So no wonder some of our valued competitors have already asked if they could license our content. But the videos and the experts are only half of the secret of our success. The other half is our three self-developed AIs. Trained with millions of data points over the last three years, they manage to provide the user with perfectly personalized content on the basis of a scientifically proven questionnaire on the one hand, but above all, on the basis of the user's behavior on the platform. Our AIs understand a user's psychological challenges faster and better than a real psychologist. As a result, they can continuously suggest the user exactly the content that is most effective for them personally at the very moment. Perhaps you're now thinking, does this really work without any direct dialogue? And yes, it does. And we were able to prove this last year in a study with the University of Mannheim. After just four to five weeks, our users experience an average 16% reduction in their mental stress. This is a strong statistical value. So is there a market for another mental health application? Hell yeah. <laughs> it's uh, extremely high demand and it continues to rise. The competition is very manageable in relation to the size of the market. And as already described, different people need different approaches. Two out of five companies we speak to do not yet have a mental health offering for their employees, but they want to introduce one this year. And two already have one, but they see CouchNow as an important add-on for the reasons I've already mentioned. We only started with B2B sales a few months ago, and the sales pipeline is well filled. Health insurance companies rely on Couch, Couch now to strengthen their prevention measures and avoid the costs of serial mental illnesses. And the retention rates of Couch now are impressive and show that users want to use our product in the long term and see it as a permanent companion. Everything at Couch now is fully automated, so we were able to see, we are able to scale fast and high. Last but least, we are three founders all of whom have well over 20 years of professional experience in their field and a successful track record in many projects. In the current financing round, we want to raise 2 million euros. 500,000 have already been signed and about 250,000 are committed. So it would be great to win more supporters for our mission today here. Please reach out to me afterwards and let me inspire you for Couch Now with more interesting details. Thank you very much. Great, thanks so much, Andreas. Uh, Katerin, what did you think about the presentation? Yeah, sure, you're right. We we, we received, uh, I'm sure my colleagues is the same, uh, several uh, mental health companies, tons of them. So uh, yeah, it's not so easy to want uh, to find a, a way to uh, to be innovative. Um, so um, my question for you is, what kind of business models you 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 have on on your mind now? Because uh, you mentioned some uh, two million. Uh, euros in the pipe. So where does it come? Yeah. So at the moment, we are focusing strongly on, on the B2B, on corporate health, as we see a really big momentum at the moment. Um, the DHR departments uh, are, are waking up and they, they have to have something for their mental health for their employees. And we go direct, we do direct B2B sales to uh, companies. We also work together with um, big platforms like big um, employee assistance programs, for example, who take us into their portfolio and sell us to um, big companies. And we work together with the health insurance companies. Um, we are not a digger, so um, the topics we are addressing on the platform are not the, the, the medical diagnosed psychological uh, illnesses. It's everything before that. Um, but health insurance companies, um, they buy our services like, like a company would do and um, give it to their um, clients. On a long term, we all also see the B2C market and we think that it will rise as big as we have fitness and nutrition already. Thank you, Katarina. Just uh -huh. as a detail for 2 million uh, in the pipe, how many companies do you have? So it, what is the, the average uh, amount uh, for each companies that you can uh, mention to us? 
it's it's very hard to say because at the mm. moment, uh, as I said, we started just a few months ago with B two B sales, and there are really big companies with two hundred thousand employees and small companies with one hundred uh, one hundred employees. Um, so the the two millions are like I would say uh, maybe twenty percent of the of what could really be possible of the pipeline pipeline. So it's very conservative um, calculated. Thank you, um, Wahid. We have to that. Um, yes, uh, what I what made me think of um, at some point during my high school, I started try to learn programming, and then my idea was to create a like a music recommendation engine for say when you feel stressed. So it was like, okay, I feel stressed, and then it spits out like uh, Bach, uh, Goldberg variations, or something like that, and then. I realized this is very difficult to do, like uh, design a quality music re recommendation engine, first of all. Uh, but then the, the second idea, and I'm coming to my question, is like, how did you, how, how did the decision land on providing videos or video input instead of um, conversation or other modalities that are uh, visible in the space? Was it just, okay, nobody's doing this, or you had some ground to come about organically? Mm -hmm. No, um, we were thinking that the solutions you already have, which are, as I said, often these kind of matching platforms, um, they are also they are always restricted with resources because they also have to bring a lot of psychologists, and that's that's uh, clear. And on the other hand, um, what also happens in the market right now, ideas of really talking to the to the AI and having a dialogue with the AI. We are strongly looking at that, but we 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 are sensitive because um, we don't think that AI yet can really be empathic. It is mathematical at the end, yeah. So it doesn't have the same empathy as a human being. But what we are doing at the moment is um, that we are trying to bring all the content of our videos, and it's three hundred now from the best experts. It will be more than one thousand in two years. We will bring all this content into our AI and um, pretty soon you can ask our AI questions. You can get in dial into the dialogue, but the content will always be from these videos. It will not be from the whole World Wide Web. So it has more assurance. Maybe just one follow-up. Sorry, for me, it would be really interesting to know whether people uh, come back to the same videos. Because same like with uh, songs, like uh, sometimes you just go back to that one song. So that's just interesting whether like people just find some uh, videos more therapeutic than the others. But I don't know if that's how it works. Yeah, I mean, that's what I uh, try to explain with the AI. Um, the, the AI get, gets to know the, the user um, more and more and better and better as more as he um, uh, yeah, behaves on the platform. And of course, there are people who are looking the same video five times and another one we suggested, they don't watch it because some information they gave us was maybe a misinterpretation from themselves. And the AI gets to know the user better and better as longer as he is moving on the platform, of course. Great. Thank you, Wahid. Um, Markus? Do you have any questions? Um, not much anymore. I mean, a lot, a lot of the things got asked and were answered. But just like, so, what's the, what's your long term then goal or way, ways where you can see that you can further expand? Well, on the one hand, uh, right now we are only in the German speaking market, and um, we think that that it is possible with our model, with our method, to um, to go to other um, markets, maybe even to the to the US. Um, but we also think for the um, for the B two C market, what we see is at the moment the mental health apps in that space they are all very concentrated and focused on the on the technique of the app. It's an app at the end, so there's no no friend who who is trying to build a whole mental health ecosystem, and that is what we are thinking in a vision that um, we think that that it really will become as important as nutrition and, and fitness at the moment, and that there will be place for a mental health lifestyle brand with festivals, with um, variable, with a lot of ecosystem around the app. This is the long-term uh, vision for the B2C market. Amazing. 
Thanks so much, Andreas, for the great answers. Um, great to have you with us today. Thank you for that. Thank and you. Now we will move to the final presentation. Uh, the, so the last page is Pantheomics. Boaz Brill will present the opportunity to us. Hello, and thank you for hanging on uh, so long. Uh, can you see my presentation right now? Yes. OK, great. Um, so um, uh, my name is Boaz Brill. I'm a co-founder and CEO of Pentaomics. And we are looking at cancer with more detail than before. Uh, as you know, cancer is very difficult to diagnose. When a pathologist gets the biopsy, she's looking for many questions that have to be answered. The first is if this is cancer or benign. And typically, this is done by slicing uh, one thin slice out of the biopsy, staining it with H and E, the standard stain, and looking through the microscope or looking at the scanned area. Uh, area and sometimes AI can even uh, help there. But there's a much more intricate question, uh, which is which is the cancer type? Because different uh, types of, organ of, of cancer can develop in the same organ, and each of the different cancer types require different um, treatment. So for that, typically the tool is look at uh, protein expression. This is done by looking at a series of, um, of slices each of them uh, marked with a different antigen, antibody, uh, and, uh, and this is a very tedious, sometimes repetitive process. Eventually, there's a third, um, um, there's a third question, which is what is the uh, best drug for the patient? And here again, there is the use of the uh, immunostochemistry staining as well as genetics. Only when all of these answers have been, uh, questions have been answered, the pathologist can put out a diagnostic report and the oncologist will take the, uh, the patient through the first uh, treatment. This is a very long and pro uh, process, many complications, mostly due to the uh, repeatability, uh, repetitiveness of the IHC over multiple slides. What we are envisioning is a system where everything uh, of the uh, immunohistochemistry is done uh, in one slide where you put everything on one slide and get all the answers. And then uh, there's many, many benefits that can be uh, achieved. Uh, one, you save uh, precious tissue. In some cases, like lung cancer, the tissue uh, amount is very, very minute. And 15% uh, of lung cancer patients that get through biopsy don't get fully diagnosed because of that. Uh, then you can get a better diagnostics because all of the markers are on the same slide and you can uh, co-localize different markers. Faster time to treatment, reduced workload, and you can use the AI to quantify the different markers and help with the diagnosis. Uh, the way that we are doing that is by putting um, all of the markers in one uh, step. Uh, each antibody is tagged with a different fluorescent tag with a different color. All of them are placed on the tissue in one step. And then when we have all the colors, uh, we use our uh, proprietary fast hyperspectral scanner to scan in one time all of the uh, area and get the information. From here, we go to the image analysis and AI to uh, understand what is going on on the tissue. And of course, the ending point is a viewing tool for the pathologist to view flexibly the results. Uh, the benefits are this is very fast and compatible with the current workflow. Looking at this kind of image, what we actually want to do, and this is what is done by our software, is to separate the different markers so you can see each of them separately, and then you can combine any two of them together uh, to understand better what is going on. And this is exactly what is happening. Here is a real life example. This is a three by five millimeter uh, healthy tissue. Uh, uh, and you can see the, the large structures here. Uh, of a healthy tissue, uh, focusing on part of the area, you can see the individual cells, but here you have many markers, one on top of the other. Right now, I'm showing each of them separately, and you can see eight different markers, uh, as each of them would look like if I would have to, to stain them uh, individually, but here it's everything on the same cells, so you can really click in and out every couple or every triple of, of markers and see what is going on, 
do uh, all the, the analysis on this one slide and get even much more information than in use, using the, the, the current methods. Uh, here is how cancer looks like. This is um, a, a slide from our a preliminary uh, retrospective clinical study. You can see those large cells that have several markers on top of them uh, are the, uh, the cancer cells. And of course, this is very informative and helpful for the pathologist. The market is huge. Uh, cancer biomarket market uh, uh, is, is over $15 billion uh, per year currently. Uh, looking at our specific uh, total available market, we are looking at 2 million uh, patients per year that are diagnosed for the main indications that are, can benefit from multiplexing uh, only in the main markets, uh, leading to a $1 billion market opportunity for us. The business model is a razor razor blade selling the standing panel as is consumable. Uh, and uh, this is what uh, the hospitals and labs that are our customers, uh, B2B of course, uh, are, are used to, to, to pay. Uh, the leadership team is very experienced. My own background is in physics. I have a PhD in physics, also an MBA. I have uh, an experience, huge uh, long-term uh, uh, managerial experience, uh, for example, as uh, in, in Nova Measuring Instruments, a NASDAQ company. Um, my co-founder uh, is a professor in the Technion. And we have a uh, strong collaboration with Shiba, and Professor Isabel Belshak is our uh, medical advisor. In terms of financing, currently we haven't done any uh, uh, dilutive rounds. Our, our pre uh, pre seed is a uh, is a two million uh, grant, two million euro grant from uh, from a project under Horizon 2020, uh, and currently we're looking for a uh, two million uh, euro uh, additional uh, funding to complete our seed round after we already have a term sheet with a leading Israeli incubator for 1.5 million dollars. Right. Thank you, boss. I have to stop you there now. Okay, thank you. Let's go to the Q&A session. Um, Jill, you have to start. What do you think about the company presentation? Sure, no, uh, excellent. Thank you for sharing this. Uh, it definitely is an issue when you're doing immunohistochemistry, having uh, multiple antibodies. Um, with some of those though, you know, there are issues with uh, specificity of the antibodies sometimes. So how are you able to have an eight plex Right, CD3 notoriously is one that has definitely uh, had some difficulties. And how are you making sure um, you're having the right concentration and permeability uh, for the tissue? So the specificity is based on uh, the, uh, the clones that are uh, used already in the clinic. We don't invent new uh, clones. We just tag them and use them. And um, from our experience, uh, they are as sensitive as they are uh, using the, the standard IHC method. Um, putting multiple mar markers on the same uh, tissue at once uh, is not an issue, and, and others have proven that you can even put uh, tens of markers without uh, losing sensitivity because each of them is targeting a different target. How will you look at the business model for this? Are you targeting more diagnostic laboratories or more like larger cancer care centers? What are your thoughts about that? Well, any any anywhere where there's a large pathological uh, lab that could be a CRO uh, like Quest or LabCorp, there could be a large hospital running its own facility, uh, would be doing uh, immunohistochemistry and they will be our, our, our partners. Uh, we are talking about um, uh, not a very large number of very big customers uh, and the business model is selling the consumables, selling the... Uh, the uh, markers, the, the, the staining panel, uh, because uh, this is a model that I used to, and the business model uh, is very uh, uh, generous in this term because um, uh, for a several hundred uh, dollars per patient and uh, 10 patients per day, uh, we can get a revenue of, of almost a, a million dollars per system per year uh, in, a single, uh, in, a, in a single indication. Uh, so uh, the margins are quite uh, there. Great, thank you. Um, Katerin, do you have any questions? Yeah, thank you for the presentation. So uh, first question for you is, uh, so your your products or your solution is, is uh, targeting more the clinical routine uh, market or the R&D labs? 
Yes, we, we, are, we are specifically targeting the clinical uh, routine practice because in the, in the R&D uh, world, there are already solutions that provide multiplexing, but they are not able to really go into the clinic because they are very expensive, slow, and complex to, uh, to operate. Our system is developed specifically to be very fast. Our optical uh, technique enables very fast scanning. Uh, everything is done in one go, one staining step, one uh, scanning step. Uh, the the R and D tools are typically cyclical. They do a few uh, markers and then uh, wash them out, put another bunch, and this is very tedious and doesn't fit the the lab. So in the clinic right now, there are no solutions that are being used. Yeah, so you you probably know that there's a few uh, numbers of labs that are already uh, equipped with the uh, scans for now. Uh, probably around ten percent. So labs and uh, so what kind of price do you uh, imagine for this kind of uh, equipment uh, which could be one of the barrier but not only the only one for sure well as i said uh because the the the, the staining panel uh sale uh, provides us a revenue stream which is very considerable uh we are planning of putting the scanner for free or it's a loan uh and uh, we will not charge for that so as long as we get a uh, sufficient uh, revenue stream from the from the staining panels, we don't have to charge for the for the uh, uh, scanner. If we go for R and D, uh, we can charge about three hundred thousand dollars per scanner. This is a typical price. Thank you, Catherine. Um, Wyatt or Marcus, we have less than a minute. Maybe just one of you can ask the Maybe. question. And maybe maybe I can go because uh, it's more of a technical nature. I spent about five years in the lab trying to uh, combine um, different um, antibodies and IF protocols. Um, so it'd be actually, um, can you uh, do live cell imaging with these? And is it uh, optimized for certain sets of um, antibodies? Or is it like I can just choose um, up to 10 antibodies of choice and then do whatever I want with it? So for clinical use, the way that we envision it right now is that we optimize uh, uh, an eightplex or a tenplex that go specifically for one indication. If this is uh, lung cancer, uh, there is uh, one set that covers everything that is needed. And in, in most uh, routine practice, uh, the pathologist would just use the same set over and over. And then we can really validate the set and make sure that everything works together. If you want to modify that, that takes some R&D and revalidation. And this is something that we don't envision to happen every day in the, in the hospital. In R&D, people are, are, are inventing their own sets every day, but then they don't have to validate them, so it's much easier. But uh, for us, it's more like uh, a whole solution end-to-end -end validated. Thank you. Right. Thank you, Wait. Thank you, boss, for the great presentation. Great answers. Feel free to reach out to him directly after the conference. Yeah, and this is the end of the event. I'd like to say thank you, all the presenters, advisors, and everyone in the audience, and especially the ones staying with us until the end. Uh, maybe just before we close, uh, maybe we can hear a few words about the advisors, kind of say goodbye and make, make some small comment about the event. Um, Marcus. Yeah, um, thanks for the invite. Um, very interesting companies. Um, also, you found a good mix. I actually had only met one of them before, so that that doesn't happen very often. Um, but I also really log like the the broad variety, different backgrounds, like something for everyone. Great. Thank you, Marcus. Thank you for being here. Um, Jill. Yeah, no, thank you. Uh, I think everyone did uh, very excellent presentations and really handled the questions well. Um, there definitely is a lot of food for thought coming out of this. Um, it was interesting to see uh, far more diagnostic plays than I you know, typically see on a day-to-day -day basis. Thank you so much, uh, Wahid. Yeah, it was a uh, great, I think there was, it was very dynamic. People came uh, well prepared. Um, I'd love to see the companies get the funding, especially Pentomics, uh, the last one. Um, um, in terms of um, having seen, I feel like we as a fund have seen most of the deals here, but it's just great to have this additional um, touch or input 
Um, and yeah, I'm uh, I'm open or available to t talk about um, science and projects more. So, yeah. Absolutely. Great. Thank you. Great. Um, Catherine? Yeah, thanks. Thanks for the invite. Uh, very uh, good presentation. It's very hard to, to, to pitch in five minutes, guys. So congrats because it's short time and uh, you already, uh, always miss something. So that was great. Interesting diversity. Uh, and a variety of companies and business models and, and risks too. So yeah, great, interesting. Great, thanks so much, Catherine. Thank you for all the advisors, everyone here. Um, we are planning to have another health tech investment conference, potentially early July, just before summer. Uh, so I hope everyone, I see you there as well. Thanks so much and have a good night or have a good evening. Okay. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you so much. Bye. Bye-bye. Thank you very much.